to our second Saturday session. My name is Laura Morris and I am past president of WCA and programming chair. And today we are going to be talking about the role of art and activism in science, technology, education, and math, STEM education. And our panel chair is Amanda Banks from the Alabama chapter. So welcome, welcome. Amanda, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Could you introduce yourself and um, talk a little bit about what will be going on today and introduce your panelists. Absolutely. Thank you, Laura. Um, hi, it is nice to meet all of you who I don't know. My name is Amanda Banks. I have been the president of the Alabama Women's uh, Caucus chapter since uh, 2020. Um, before that, I was vice president and before that I was treasurer. So I've been involved with uh, the chapter for quite a few years. I joined in 2017 and um, we are a really diverse chapter. We have 143 members um, across the state, 60 of whom are active. Um, and we really were looking for ways to kind of show that diversity um, and bring it to the national conference. Uh, then when the conference went virtual, we kind of decided to pivot and film um, our panelists um, giving interview questions. So uh, we could present that to you today. Um, I am joined today by Sarah adkins Savansky. Uh, she is here uh, to do Q&A after we view these interviews that we filmed. Um, and Jessica Nuno, who's also um, one of the interviewees, will be hopping on um, during a Q&A session as well. So um, I will play these interviews for you. Uh, it runs uh, about half an hour. So get comfy, get yourself something to drink um, and listen to what um, we recorded. And then uh, once the film is over, we'll open it up to questions uh, from everyone. So if I will share my screen. If you'll be patient with me right. for just a moment. And people can feel free as they're watching it to put questions in the chat. Um, and then we'll have the Q&A after. All right, are you able to see the screen over here okay? Perfect, all right, I will hit play. So my name is Sarah Atkins-Sabonski. Are y'all able to hear? Yes. I was a military kid, so I actually moved around a lot in the US, but I finally decided to call my home, Birmingham, Alabama, for school. I went to UAB, and at UAB, I was initially a science student, and I stuck with science. Um, but in one of my art classes, one of my professors truly convinced us and everyone in the room, I'm not sure if all of them ended up becoming professional artists, but it really hit home with, with me what they said, that all of us had the capacity to be artists. So that was an introductory, like intro to 2D course. Um, but from there, I went on to get my art degree. And so I graduated from UAB wanting to be a student or wanting to go on to be a physician. Um, and I can tell you more about where, where I am on that journey in a bit, but Sort of my, my world collided um, shortly after that when I didn't get into med school the first time. And the research lab that I was in at the time was a microbiology lab. And my professor convinced me that I should go to grad school in his microbiology lab. So there I was beginning microbiology. Um, he also told me to apply for this pretty prestigious fellowship from the National Science Foundation, the Graduate Research Fellowship. And really not knowing what I was signing up for, I applied and I got it, which was really a really big deal. But it also meant that I had this ticket to finish my PhD at UAB. So there was a microbiology lab um, with, with a somewhat growing interest in microbiology and microbial sciences. Um, but really what my fellowship allowed me to do was not just study microbiology, but study how we can reform microbiology classes at the university level using art. So that's what a lot of my work did. So I was, I was both growing do these really cool types of paintings called agar art. So um, what we had students do in petri dishes was they paint using bacteria. And I got really excited um, for students to be able to use these petri dishes as a way of growing in their observational skills, but they also used what they looked at in the petri dishes as a way to create their own types of science experiments. And I was able to do that also, and I really grew in my own development as an agar artist and in the bio art scene um, as a result of being able to be in grad school. Um, so that's sort of where I am, and I actually finished my PhD at UAB um, this summer. Very thankful um, that I was able to do all of that. 
Um, and I did eventually get into med school, so I'm currently a student doctor. So in some sort of my timeline, um, I've been able to be a scientist, an artist, a researcher, and now a student physician in, in some really cool ways. And I've got to meet lots of really cool people. Um, in terms of my artwork, a lot of the artwork I make, I think, synergizes all of those ideas. Um, I really enjoyed being able to make agar art, so these paintings and petri dishes. Um, one of my favorite like ways to make it is using soil bacteria. So when you take bacteria from the soil, you take it back to the lab and you can dilute it out and eventually pick out certain bacteria that are growing sort of in these natural environments. And they create these beautiful hues and pigmentations. So when you plate them and draw with them in petri dishes called agar, so agar um, has this like, it's sort of like a hardened jello that the bacteria can grow on. And when you, when you paint them on the petri dishes and take them out a few days later, you can see this beautiful painting. So that's sort of the line of artistry that I've gotten really into. Um, and when I think about my artist statement or why it is that I, I make these works, I think about the story of my mom um, in her podiatrist's office. So in one of her doctor's office, like telling her doctor how cool it was that her daughter makes these, these petri dish works of art. And so here I have this, this person who had never finished university talking to, to someone in her life about microbiology. And I think like that story really highlights why I think this work is really cool and why I make art. Um, it's been really cool to see uh, people in the community in Birmingham and in other places just get really excited about microbiology and biology um, through the art that I make. I am a photographer slash mixed media artist. I specifically um, specialize in surreal photography, which is basically taking a bunch of pictures, compositing them together, together and making fantastical scenes out of them. Um, my mixed media art ranges from abstract to um, conceptual um, mixed media, where my most uh, award-winning one is a piece called Grim and Berry. It's a very large piece. Uh, it's 84 by 44 inches. And it has a gaping um, hole in the middle of it where a smile is supposed to be. I, I had heard about the Alabama Women's Caucus for Art, and I was like trying to still trying to find my place and trying to find like where where I belonged and what um what kind of communities that I wanted to be a part of. And so before I joined the Women's Caucus for Art, I was a part of an organization called the Flying Monkey, which is what got me started with my studio space. When the Flying Monkey came to an end, I found that I had a uh, kind of like a void, like missing from the, the community that I was looking for. So I, I joined the Alabama Women's Caucus for Art, really not sure what to expect. <laughs> and um, my very, we had our very first session at like a group meeting and then the virus hit and which made everything go very haywire. And so like my first year being involved in um, the Women's Caucus for Art, we, we started trying to figure out how we were doing things online. So, but even though we were doing things online, it was really cool because the community was still there. And I found a lot of opportunities that were being brought to me that I didn't necessarily, I wasn't even looking for. So despite the virus and despite the fact that we were like at such a distance from each other, the community aspect I found was still there. And then, it was um, earlier at the beginning of this year, uh, um, our, our president asked me to do some more work with the, with the caucus. And I decided that I wanted to be more involved. I wanted to um, actually like be, be uh, um, part of the community and be able to give back to other artists, which is what I had previously done when I was a part of the Flying Monkey community. So I took on the roles of exhibition coordinator and secretary. And now I coordinate all different kinds of projects um, and try to help out artists as much as I can. I have been involved in the art community in Huntsville, Alabama since gosh, 2005. Um, I used to make textiles and I would sell them at a local artist's market. And then in 2012, I opened a studio at Lono Arts and Entertainment 
um, as part of the Flying Monkey arts community that um, used to exist here. And it was a really amazing experience. Uh, it taught me so much. And um, after running that business for about five years and being more involved in the community and getting to know people, I went back to college and uh, studied engineering. Uh, it was a, a big change, but it was something that I knew that I needed to do in order to move my practice forward. And um, I really enjoyed working with engineers and I was able to take some different types of art and, and blend those with engineering and teach um, people at NASA and in the Army and in the Air Force um, how to do some really interesting art techniques and uh, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, so that's what I do. Um, and when I'm not working in the arts, I am a manager at a venture capital firm. I am very big into science. I, I enjoy how I enjoy the concepts that science bring and also the concepts that uh, we break with science and how we're constantly evolving and we're constantly learning more. And a lot of times when it comes to like science fiction stories and science fiction illustrations, we, we take like a, a kernel of truth, a kernel of fact from what already exists. And as artists, as writers, we can take that and we can jump on it and we could create something much more elaborate, something um, that we might not have necessarily thought of before. And then from the science point of view, a lot of the things that we're creating now have come from those stories. So uh, things like uh, touch screens and, and uh, we have other technologies like with, uh, like with electric cars and things involving uh, biofuel and things like that. All of that were concepts that originally started in science fiction stories and from like hundreds of years back. And we took those concepts as like as scientists and we we made them reality because of the way that artists and writers think. Yeah, so when I started in grad school, the American Society for Microbiology put out this call in 2015. Um, for basically people all over the world to make agar art. So they really, uh, and like the public interest in agar art as a field of art and as a microbiology tool, I think really um, hit, pretty, hit pretty hard with the public in 2015. And it's been growing ever since. Um, but in the meantime, right, I was a scientist. I was trying to get better at art. Like I had an art degree. Um, I was pursuing that. But I was also interested in sort of the, the historical examples of the merging of art and science. And so I came across many examples um, Samuel Morse, if you may know um, Samuel Morse for the Morse code, was actually a classically trained painter um, and deconstructed one of his paintings. So he learned of his, his wife's death um, in a pretty untimely man manner and, and actually didn't hear of it in time. So his idea was to, to create a communication tool. So he deconstructed one of his, the stretchers, which are the, the wooden bars in his paintings, and prototyped the first telegraph. So that was an example of, of art and science merging. Um, and then we see people like Niels Bohr, who was really into cubist art, um, looking at one piece of art and realizing you can see multiple perspectives reflected simultaneously. And Niels Bohr, um, his idea of this sort of duality made him realize that quantum objects in the field of quantum mechanics, that things could exist as both particles and waves at the same time. And so, we, and then sort of taking these examples to biology, these things that I was learning about at the intersection of art and science, we see basically um, my favorite person ever, Alexander Fleming. So in the 1940s, um, Fleming was credited with the discovery of penicillin. And he came back after a vacation and realized there was mold, what he called mold juice growing on one of his plates. Um, but it's thought that that discovery of antibiotics of penicillin, which ended up saving um, thousands of people's lives, um, was thought to be attributed to his visual acuity because he was also a self-taught watercolor artist. So learning about all of these examples when I'm starting in grad school, trying to see like, if these are scientists that are using art to pull from to make these really important discoveries, how can I be a part of that? Um, 
So I think a lot of those examples, especially when we see Alexander Fleming, he not only like made that discovery of penicillin, um, but he was also able to, to create the first works of agar art. So I think a lot of my purpose and what I do tries to pull from that canon while also making it more available to students, more like metropolitan community. If you know this, or maybe if you don't know, but all of us were like classically trained white older men. Um, and so being able to make a lot of these discoveries and these moments available to more students um, and more community members, I think is really important in why I'm making the art that I do and why I teach it the way that I do. I am fascinated by how the world works, and I'm fascinated by all of the different things that we have the ability to understand. Um, I very much believe that we were put here to understand the world and to understand how it works so that we can take care of it properly. And in order to do that, you have to educate yourself, and you have to be able to educate others. So I see my work as a way to put this out there and get people curious about how you can combine what a lot of people think are two separate ways of thinking. It's, I hear it all the time, you know, right-brained and left-brained, you know, oh, you're an artist, or oh, you're an engineer. Um, it's so rare that you mix the two, but it's really not. Everyone does it. They just don't know that they do it. I feel like there's messages that need to be told that um, it's just the typical way of doing it, the very classical way of doing it, I don't believe it goes far enough. I feel like in order to understand what someone is saying, you need vision, uh, vision, vision, visionary ways of saying it. Um, I will say when I had uh, went into college, my initial uh, skill set was just drawing and uh, yeah, I was just drawing. And when I got, um, I wanted to go into college to learn more practical skills like uh, digital art with graphic design and all that. Um, until I got to my first digital art um, class, um, her name was um, Professor Black. I cannot remember her first name right now, but she had a digital comp composite um, a bunch of images we made from our, um, we took uh, photos from our, uh, from our phones, and I actually liked it. So um, it just, and then uh, years down the line, we picked it back up with uh, digital cameras, and I'm like, this is something I can actually make whatever I want. And it just wasn't so limited by photography anymore. It wasn't just straight photography, which is nothing bad about that. I just have different ways of viewing the world. And that's the way I, and when I make these fantastical pictures, that is how I communicate with the world with what I see. Oh gosh, okay, I am more capable than I give myself credit for, and that there is so much that I don't know. I am always learning new things, and I am always finding a new perspective to look at problems from. Um, I used to be very cut and dry. I used to see the world, you know, very black and white, and you know, there are only two ways to answer the question. But now I understand that that is just absolutely not the case, and it has helped me really just grow as a person and communicate better with other people, um, and and help other people understand too that. We all have a lot to learn, and we all have a lot of ways that we can grow. What's been really cool as a teacher is that I have been able to push myself further than if I hadn't been teaching. My students, they always want to learn more, you know, they're, they're very curious, and they might come to me with something that I have never practiced before. And so they they push me as much as I push them. So I get them to think outside of the box. I get them to be more creative with their characters, to think about the backstories of their characters, to take what I was talking about before with that, that little kernel of truth or fact and to give them a jumping off point. And then they will run with it. And then they'll encounter something and they're like, 
I don't know how to do this. And then I'll find, I don't know how to do that either. <laughs> but um, I end up uh, going in and I study just as much as they study and I work right alongside my students. And in the long run, it has made my work grow even further. I think in the science academy, when I'm working on a research project, it's really easy to think like, oh, this data supports this thing that we thought, and that's the conclusion. And I have answered that, and I have learned that object, or I've learned that thing, which is really cool for advancing science. But I think it really gets in my head about the way that knowledge works. So when I teach using art and science together, especially when we have students making these novel discoveries in their own petri dishes, like it puts me in a place where I can become a student again and learn with the students and observe things that I've never observed before. So I think teaching at this intersection really humbles me and makes me realize that like I am perpetually a student with my students and they are also teachers. I would say that living in the South has definitely influenced how I think about science and art in many ways. Uh, first and foremost, I wouldn't be a scientist or an artist if it wasn't for UAB and sort of Alabama as a whole and the community of people here. Like those identities were have have been born for me in Alabama. So it's hard to disentangle on um, that community from my identity. And there's been like countless people whose works I've really depended on and have inspired me, um, not only throughout college, but also in the sort of broader Alabama community. Um, lots of like poetry and art that I pull from. But I think something else, so I guess I have to confess when I moved to Alabama, that I had a lot of bias against what I thought Alabama would be like and the people here. But I had in my head, I thought that it was like on all a monolith of, of people who are basically all the same. And I was like, this is going to be hard. And people are like, oh my gosh, you're moving to Alabama. And I sort of perpetuated that idea in my head. But I think coming here and learning and growing with all of these people, I realized like that it's not a monolith. There's lots of pockets and conversations of people going on. And there's so many voices that need to be heard here. Um, and I've been really fortunate to be able to learn from a lot of those people in the way that I make my art. Um, I would say based upon the person that I had, um, I had as a teacher impact me because I went to the University of Alabama. If I had not gone to college, if I had not gone to, um, if I had not specifically sought out visual art, I would have never learned this. I'd probably still be drawing. I'd still, well, I'd still probably be still looking for other things that just wouldn't have fulfilled me. Um, I really like making weird stuff. Um, I, I think that it is so much fun to take these engineering concepts or, or anything that has to do with math um, or technology and just turning it on its head and making people think about it in a different way. Um, for example, one of the projects that I worked on early on when I was in school, I was um, interning in a systems engineering lab, and we put together a project where we taught improv techniques, like improv theater, uh, to a group of engineers over a week, and then we had them put on an improv performance. And it's just wonderful to see that aha moment for people and to see people just having fun and thinking about you know what they do for a living in a completely different way. I like the, the research aspect of sitting down and working through the different science concepts that I'm trying to bring into my artwork. And I watch, I probably watch a ridiculous amount of documentaries, <laughs> but um, all of the, the research I find fascinating. So I'm constantly reading articles, I'm watching documentaries, I'm talking to other people in the community that are involved in more of the, the science aspect of things. And the more that I understand the concepts, the more that I can twist or break the concepts in my own artwork. And that's something that I tell all of my students. Uh, they, they will quote me now on it. I tell them that once they know the rules, they can break the rules. So when it comes to adding like a science aspect to my artwork or a science aspect to my teaching, I tell them that they have to understand the way things actually are and the way things actually work. You should understand the physics. You should understand the way things are actually grounded in reality. And once you have that understanding, that's when you can twist it and you can break it. 
and you can break it knowing how it should work. My favorite part is just playing around with the software because sometimes I just, I don't know what I'm going to do sometimes. I just start putting these pictures together. Sometimes I go look stuff up online. Before I ever put anything in Photoshop, I actually will draw this stuff out. So I'm not too um, pushed away from my original origin, which is um, drawing. So, and it just makes me comp composite it better in my mind. So I will um, go out, it's almost like a treasure hunt, or yeah, it's almost like a treasure hunt where I have to go out and find these things by e either be buying them or going out into nature and finding them or even going or traveling long distances. In one series, I actually went through, I call it rural portraits because I had to go through um, rural areas within Alabama, um, which stem from Coney, Alabama to uh, some places in West Alabama. Um, and I, would, I created these double negatives. Uh, what was digital digital photography? My favorite part about practicing art in some spaces is that scientists, almost all the scientists I've ever run into, are excited about making art. So I could just like ask any of my colleagues to help me on a project, and they will be like super excited. You know, long gone are the days of like singular singular scientists in a in a lab, sort of just doing one thing, having a certain way of thinking. Um, in the twenty first century, at least in like the the circles that I am learning science, I realize that that there aren't a lot of people who see these as siloed subjects. Um, and a lot of scientists are are open to artwork. They're open to learning. Um, something that I think is really cool about the work that I do is that we can actually have science students learn how to do science using the artwork. So I can teach like pre-meds who otherwise might be a little hesitant to learn anything about um, the humanities, I can like teach them how to draw, but I'm teaching them to draw with bacteria. So it's sort of exciting and synergizes all of these thoughts for them. So I think um, to summarize my, my answer is twofold. I think that it's exciting because a lot more scientists than I ever thought are excited about making and about using art in their practice and in, the, and in their teaching. But also we can use this as a way to actually get students excited about doing science itself. and. That's a lot different than um, the way that some of the science courses I taught were like, where it was, it was very by the book, it was very workbook, and then you leave, and you, you're not actually forming an identity as a scientist. So I think it's just really amazing that I've had the opportunity to be able to teach science students using art um, as a way to sharpen their identity as scientists. I would say trying to make sure that they look natural. Like, this is something that looks like it should happen every day, but it doesn't. Um, I, uh, my current uh, project I'm working on, which I'm bringing in a new element, which is exciting, but also challenging at the same time, because I don't know how I'm going to achieve this, but I wanted to talk about um, African-American uh, uh, African American experiences, but also mix in graffiti style which will also um, not only just use Photoshop, but will also use uh, my drawing skills that put into InDesign, which is, uh, no, not InDesign, it's, uh, it's Adobe Illustrator, which Adobe Illustrator, which is known mostly amongst graphic designers as a graphic design tool. It's not meant for really artsy things. It's used for designing logos and such and so forth. So I'm going to mix that put the graffiti style within um, Adobe Illustrator, put it into Photoshop and mix it up with my photography skills. And that's the thing with, uh, that I enjoy about technology and my photography is that I'm constantly looking for new ways to push the envelope. There have been a lot of challenges communicating art concepts in the film space. It's a lot of people really do believe that you can either be artistic or you can be technical and, and scientific minded. There's a big pushback on incorporating art into STEAM, especially for myself. I teach adults most of the time, and I work with a lot of adults who do not believe that they have artistic ability or that they have thinking ability. And overcoming that initial hesitation and getting people to really 
just try it and just go for it and and experience it and experiment with it. Um, part of being a scientist is experimenting and part of being an artist is experimenting. And if you can get people to understand that that's really the same process, you're really doing the same thing there, um, it, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Something that I've really run into is I know a lot about some scientific topics or I'll want to communicate those things. But sometimes without a text panel, it's hard to really explain what it is I'm trying to communicate. So I can show like petri dishes, for instance, if two bacteria are interacting, two soil bacteria are interacting in a petri dish, and we see a space between them, we can see obvious markers of antibiotic resistance, which is really cool. And that's a really great learning tool, especially for pre-meds and for the general public to know that antibiotics are produced from soil bacteria. They sort of um, are the original creators of antibiotics. And so that's why pumping those things back into the ecosystem can disrupt a lot of um, biological communities. But if that's something I want to teach through my art, then I think I have to be a lot more methodical than I thought about being able to point that out. But I also want to be able to do it in an art, like an artful way. So I think sometimes having to accompany some of the works I make with text so that I'm sort of acting as a teacher at the same time I'm trying to act as an artist um, has been kind of difficult or a challenge that I'm trying to work through. It's not like I'm lecturing in front of us, a group of students, and I can point to the image and I can say, here, look at this. Because as an artist, sometimes your, your art exists outside of yourself. So you still want to be able to communicate that sometimes with or without words. Sometimes it's really hard, especially like when I encounter certain students, they don't necessarily have the mindset to think outside of the box like that. They're, they're very constrained. And in some cases, um, I'm able to help them break out of that. And I do it through working through the concepts, like the fundamentals of art with them. And I break everything down so that they understand that there's a starting point and then you can push something further. But I have also found that some people are just not open to that and they have like their own way of thinking and they don't want to bring necessarily those fundamental concepts into what it is that they're creating. So sometimes there's a barrier and sometimes I can get past it and sometimes I can't. I would say that art is definitely undervalued when it comes when it comes to STEM. I taught specifically STEM and STEAM education for about three years prior to moving directly into our education. And my role when I was working in STEAM and STEM education was to bring the art aspect to, to STEM. So of course that brought its own set of challenges. And those challenges usually involve that they want everything that you do to be very technology based. And so there can be a lack of resources when it comes to technology in the art. And people tend to not understand that art is actually involved with every aspect of STEM itself, from the science to the technology to the engineering and the math. Art is involved in all of it. And it's a way of thinking. It's not necessarily just like the act of creating something visual, but art is a way of thinking as well. And a lot of students, they, they process things from not just an auditory point of view, but from a kinesthetic and from a visual point of view as well. So anytime you can add something artistic in with the curriculum, whether it's science-based or technology or engineering or math, the concepts are going to register easier because of the kinesthetic learning aspect and the act of doing, as well as the, the, the visual aspect. So that's why when I'm working with my students, I let them draw. Even if I'm teaching just a straight science concept or a straight technology concept, I let them draw and I let them write while I'm talking. That way they're getting the kinesthetic aspect and the visual aspect and translating what's in their head down to the paper. And it tends to solidify it better for them. So with STEAM, adding in the A is also important because 
you have design aspects in the technology, you have design aspects in science and in math and in uh, engineering and being able to understand how to design and how to visually put things together is very important. And it's something that I currently feel is undervalued in, in STEM. So when I was working specifically in that area, it was my goal to bring art and, and to help solidify arts place in STEM education. That's a really great question. So when I was starting out and trying to put art and science together in the classroom, Something that I immediately did was talk to everyone I possibly could talk to. So I remember like talking to neuroscientists and chemistry educators, even people who I didn't think like, this is exactly the field I want to go into. I tried to learn from as many people as possible. And I think as I matured in, in the line of work that I ended up doing, um, I guess my like bigger advice would be if there's anyone's work like online or in person that you are interested in like at all, I would encourage you to talk to them. Um, that's something that our professor, Doug Veloss at UAB, I think has really instilled in me and a lot of the um, conversations that they've had um, is that like people, there's not a lot of artists or scientists who don't want to talk to other people. So like you can send them an Instagram message, you can send them an email, and me being able to do that every time I'm in a new city and there's someone I really want to talk to, I'll just like strike up an email and be like, please meet with me. Like, I mean, I'm a really big fan of yours. Um, and people are almost always willing to do that. And there are so many artists and scientists that I've learned from and tools that I've been able to use in the classroom because of that. Um, and I think one last thing is that there's so many communities of people who are already interested in, in the type of work that I was doing. And I think I learned about that sort of in, in the past few years, but it would have really been beneficial for me had I learned about those communities um, earlier on in grad school. So I think, like there's Sci Art Magazine, there's a lot of conferences like the Bio Summit. There are huge communities of people, not only in the South, but all over the globe who are having these conversations. And I think being able to tap into those conversations like can really help scientists and educators um, and artists sort of merge all of these things together in their classroom. I would say whatever, because um, like when I was growing up in high school, I told people, I was just like, I want to be a computer science and visual artist. I want to combine these things. And they told me, well, I don't really see them going together. I'm just like, I feel like there's a way you can, though. And so only until I got to college, um, when I learned some skill sets. So I would say definitely go learn some new skills and um, figure out how they can possibly mess together. So I remember my, I remember when I, um, in every art, um, in every art degree, you have to have a senior art project before you leave. And my, my combination of, I used um, a, a VR headset mixed in with my photography, mixed in with 3D modeling of a, to make a exhibit of sorts inside of the visual um, reality headset. And I didn't have to do as much coding as you would think I would have to do. I just had to learn how to use software. So, um, as I said, definitely go learn some new skills. YouTube is your best friend. The internet is your best friend. Um, it's a lot more challenging than you think initially if you're wanting to incorporate art into STEM spaces and, and STEM practices. Um, be patient with yourself. Be patient with the people around you. Give grace as much as you can. People are going to be frustrated. They're going to face challenges. and just being there and being willing to say, I don't know how something works, or you know, I I don't know the best way to approach this problem. Let's figure it out together. Um, there's a lot of learning that we all do together, and just being willing to support each other and and learn as we go, um, and also be willing to say, hey, you know what? I know you're not an artist, but this is you know a really just give it a shot. Give it a try, have fun with it, and just enjoy the process.
Okay, thank you all so much for watching these interviews. Um, I really appreciate everyone being here. Uh, now we can open up the floor for some questions and answers. Um, I am joined by Sarah and Jessica, who you heard from in the video. Um, Phoebe could not make it today. Um, so we're happy to chat with you, um, answer questions, or even hear about some of your experiences. Does anyone have any questions? Fancy. I, um, I just want to say that I, afterward, I'm planning to look up everybody <laughs> who participated so I can see, you know, the art and, and understand a little bit better how that goes along with what they were saying. Well, I have um, here, I will paste in the chat. These are um, the links to our um, ALWCA, our main website, and then um, each of the panelists' Instagram accounts. Uh, that's where we pretty much all track what we're doing. Um, and then also a link to um, Cynthia Wagner's website. She's the woman um, who uh, very graciously loaned us her space to film those interviews in. Uh, and those are in the chat. You should be able to access them just by clicking on the links. Thank you. Great. Absolutely. Wonderful. And let's see, I have some images from Sarah that I can share. Um, Sarah, would you be interested in talking about the pieces um, after I pull them up? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Thanks for bearing with me while I get all of these set up and go in here across my three different screens. All right. So Sarah, take it away. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about related to Petri dish art. So these are made from uh, soil bacteria that we got from UAB's campus, but you can really dig them up anywhere. You take them back to the lab and they create um, little dots on a Petri dish and then you can go out and culture them. And then to make an image like this, I would and this is something that we teach our students to do in the classroom too, um, basically make a drawing. In this case, this is one of the logos for a kombucha tap room in Birmingham, Alabama called Harpus Roots. So I just drew their logo um, and I put the white sheet of paper under a Petri dish. And then I basically sort of like painting with like invisible ink, trace the logo with the bacteria strains, put it in an incubator for a few days, depending on the type of bacteria um, and then take it out. And this one's really cool. They I was really excited to be able to make their logo out of soil bacteria because um, Harvest Roots is really into um, using Alabama um, vegetables and, and plants, which is just, it was really cool to be able to do that for them. Um, and that's how uh, all of these works sort of go. I are directly painting images in Petri dishes using these bacteria. And so you can start to see at least on, or on any of them really, you can start to say like, oh, well, did she intend for it to look like that? And, and the answer is usually no. Like in this example, um, you can see the heart. So this was all filled in with, um, I believe this was serratia. So this is a, a human pathogen. Um, I don't, we don't usually let the, the students work with some of these microbes, but, but in the case of me working in the lab, I was able to. We can start to see how the, the outside of the heart has a deeper red pigmentation, even though I filled the whole thing in. So you can start to appreciate some of the ecology and, and how the, the microbes are interacting. So they release more of their pigmentation when they're growing outward. Um, which is just really cool. And there's another uh, chromobacter bacteria that's pretty common in the soil that made the purple. Um, and sometimes we can also appreciate uh, the interactions between them. I think in the next piece, um, we can also see the density of the pigmentation much, much clearer and how the, the cells are basically swarming outward. Um, I didn't have any examples in, in these three cases, but in, in some of them, you can see antibiotic interactions. So that's basically a... Um, in the Petri dish, you'll see like there's no bacteria growing when you put two of them together. And that's because one of them is producing an antibiotic. So it's really cool. A lot of, a lot of the Petri dish works that we have students make, um, they start to see those types of interactions too, which is really cool to be able to teach people going into medicine, how our medicines are actually derived. So you dropped 
pigment into the, the Petri dish. And what you just showed is a photograph of what um, it looked like after a while. Uh, so it's not, yeah, they're, they're bacteria, it's bacteria. So it's not, they create the pigment. So I'm, it's basically, uh, maybe I can oh, show so the Oh, so the picture. bacteria create the pigment. It's not that you dropped paint in there yeah. and it grew back to, uh, showed what bacteria were in the paint. Right. Okay. And embarrassingly enough, I don't actually know how to paint, but I do know how to sort of paint with the microbes, right? Um, yeah, so that's just directly using the growth of the bacteria and a lot of them create these pigment, um, these pigments, which if you think about it, um, this is something my advisor used to say a lot, bacteria don't really have eyes. So they're not creating these pigments for like a reason. It, they're just sort of metabolites. They're antibiotics. They are, um, they they're helping them photosynthesize. It's just by happenstance that they happen to look like these colors um, when we put them on, on nutrients or agar. And so as, as an artist, we are in, in the arts and the science arts, we can sort of take advantage of that and um, make these really cool drawings and see some of these interactions. Yeah, so almost all of those are just straight up bacteria growing on plates. And then you make a drawing based on looking at that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I see, very, wow, that is so fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for walking through this, Sarah. I always love uh, when I see your work go up. Um, I'm always fascinated and like looking at, at all of the new agar art you created. Um, uh, Jessica, do you happen to have any um, examples of your work that um, you would like to share? Uh, yeah, sure. I have, I'm here on my computer. So if um, you guys would like, I can share my screen and show you some pieces that are in my portfolio. I just need a second to pull them up. Absolutely. Uh, while you're getting that pulled up, um, does anyone have um, any additional questions for Sarah or um, about anything else that you saw in our film? A question for Sarah. So you're doing you're doing the agar art. Are you then taking pictures of it and printing them out and then displaying them as your art, or how are you taking? Because it it can't last forever in the petri dish, as we all well know, or it keeps growing or it dies. Um, what are you doing then with the imagery you're taking? Yeah. I just, as a very simple person, just usually create prints of them and then display them as prints because that, that means I'm not, no biosafety hazards anywhere. Um, but a lot of artists will pour resin into the Petri dish plate so that the bacteria cannot grow anymore. And then they'll wrap it with film. So I have seen some instances of people preserving the plates in that way. Okay. Um, but when I was working in the lab, I just usually like to get rid of them um, so that I wasn't, you know, no one, biosafety people weren't like, you know, breathing down my back or anything. Right. No humans were, were harmed in this. That's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. So this is um, some of the pieces that are in my portfolio. So I do, wait, hold on. Let me see. I got to share my screen slightly differently. Okay, I think now you guys could see the stuff pulled up. Let me know if you can't. Can you guys see this image here? Um, it's got rabbits in it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I do a whole lot of work with um, like creature design. So uh, like creature design, um, anatomy, character design, world building. Um, so I teach a lot of classes involving uh, like comic and illustration work. Um, on top of doing like my own comic and illustration work. So I have a like prior to me teaching art, like my background is directly in art. Um, but for a long time before I started teaching art specifically, I was teaching STEM education and I was teaching physical science. So when I was doing that, I I gained, I kind of always had a love for science, but I gained like an even greater understanding of like the concepts. And as I was teaching all of my students these concepts, like in these specific science classes, I found that they became absolutely necessary in regards to this type of stuff that I was working on for my own illustration work. So 
I had to apply these physical concepts. Um, I had to apply chemistry. I had to apply, apply biology to be able to make things like this. So as I was teaching creature design, I started to understand more that I had to have at least some sort of an understanding of biology in order to be able to make these creatures make sense. Whenever you're doing things in a science fiction or a fantasy world, you know, there, there are concepts that can be so out there. And in there's a lot of stories where we don't even make a connection to what's happening in them because we don't have any sort of grounding in reality. So when you're doing some sort of a science fiction story, you need to have these science concepts to give you some sort of a grounding. And whenever you're making like a creature, you need to have something familiar in it for the person looking at it to have a connection to. So when I design my creatures, I do a lot of mashups. So like here in this one, it's a combination of rabbits, insects, and uh, crystals. So all of the anatomy, I learned how the anatomy would fit together. So I did a lot of studying of skeletons. I did a lot of studying of muscle structures specifically so that I can understand how one thing could fit into another and actually make something that functioned and moved properly. So I did that with these ones. Like this is one of my uh, first sets of creatures, but I've done others. Like this one is one of my favorites. Um, they're all a part of like a story in a world that I'm building involving uh, like a mad scientist who goes crazy designing all of these experiments. So like here, I had to think about how like this anatomy would actually function so that like the spine could fit in with the tentacles because like uh, cephalopods, they don't have spines. So I had to really look at how those things would fit to be able to make this look like it could function and actually move. And the best creature designers um, who do stuff for movies and things like that are applying all of these science concepts. The best science fiction movies, they go and they talk to um, like people in the science field so that they can have that grounding in reality. So that's what I do, and that's what I bring um, to all of my students when I'm teaching them. Um, I also, like I was talking about uh, skeletons and things like that, I do a lot of skeleton studies. Um, so I look at, uh, like here, I was specifically studying, um, this is a canine skull, but I was studying bioluminescence. So I'm working through an entire series involving um, like skeletons mixed with different like bioluminescent uh, creature or different bio bioluminescent things. So like here is uh, crystals, but I have another one involving like fungi. Do you use um, photographs of skeletons or where do, how do you, where do you find the images? Um, I actually have uh, apps that I use. They're 3D modeling apps. Um, they're really fantastic. I have one called Handy and another one called Pose It. Um, so you can get them on your phone. And they, uh, they're they absolutely amazing. And illustrators all over the world use these because um, they give you like the skeletons of, like Handy gives you the skeletons of hands and feet. Um, and so you can have it with this, like you can see the skeleton or you can see all the skin and stuff on top of it. And I can change the position of the hand, right? So like I can, I can contort it and then I can turn it in any different direction that I want and I can change the light sources. In that same app, they have a whole section in there of skeletons, like uh, specifically animal skeletons. So this one and the one that you saw prior to that, came from a selection that they had um, in their 3D modeling software where I could turn the skulls in the direction I want and put the lighting on them. The other app, the Posa app, um, allows for uh, figurative work. So I can see, um, I can actually break it down. So I've got the skeleton, I've got the muscle structure, and I've got um, like all of the skin on top of it. And I can take that and I can position any one of them 
really in any position I want and I can turn it. Like I can look from the bottom, I can look from the top, I can look from the side and I can even put multiple different figures on there interacting um, so that I can see how all of those groupings work. So, so these are all digital. These are all digitally put together from all of those um, images. Um, my work is all traditional. Um, so I use the apps as a reference and a reference only. So like I, I pull them up here on my phone, which is like uh -huh. one of my best tools. Uh, it's probably got more screenshots in it than it does anything else. Um, but this is all done by hand. So I work wow. in um, like a three-step method. I start with pencil and I do really clean lines. Then I go back on top of it and I do um, like just straight line work. Um, so like to give you guys an example of the line work, like this is the rabbits all done in line. Wow. So that would be like the next step. And again, that's all done by hand. And then what you guys saw in color, I work with um, marker, alcohol markers specifically. So I like the, um, the blending that alcohol markers can give me. I get really highly saturated color. And I'm also really big into using the science of color um, in my artwork. So I do a lot with color theory and I do a lot of uh, blending and mixing of the colors to get certain uh, emotions um, and not just emotions, but I'll try to get like, I'll try to build the world around the color so that the color is bringing life to everything. I have a specific goal with my work so that everything that I do in line can stand alone just as line and then um, color is enhancing it. These are incredible. Thank you so oh, much thank for you. sharing them. You're welcome. All right. So thank you so much, Jessica. I appreciate you being here. Um, Unfortunately, the work that I did really was not visual. Um, it was more performance art. Um, so there are no images to share from that. Uh, there is a paper that has been published though, if anyone is interested in reading um, an academic uh, scientific publication, it is out there um, in the ether. Uh, put the you... link in. Okay, all right, I will find the link, I promise. Um, and then I will put that in before we hop off. Uh, does anyone have any additional questions? Um, well, I, I oh, go ahead, Lori. I just wanted to say that you all and your chapter really did a huge amount of work and were prepared to make an amazing contribution to the conference. Mm -hmm. And I'm so sorry that we didn't get to meet in Chicago, but thank you so much for all of the content that you provided, the wonderful workshop idea, and all of the, all of the information you were gonna share at the conference. Just thank you so much. Well, thank you, that, that really means a lot. We appreciate it. Um, you know, we, we love what we do and we very much believe that we are all artists and um, we we're so excited to share it with you. So um, thank you, Laura, for hosting these second Saturday sessions so that we're able to still share this work with, uh, with everyone in the WCA. Yes, I'm glad we were able to pivot a lot of the programming to the second Saturday sessions. And in fact, you guys are up next month for another second Saturday session. Um, would you like to talk about a little bit about that? It's called The Labor of Love. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Labor of Love is um, a really incredible piece that our exhibitions team put together. And I will actually pass it over to Jessica, who's the chair of our exhibitions team, uh, to talk about what they'll be presenting next month. Uh, yeah, so uh, prior to um, like the shift that we're making now, we worked on like a new a new sort of concept that we wanted to roll out in regards to like a portable exhibition. So that's what the labor of love is. Like it's, um, it's our, it's the labor of love of us working towards this new concept. So we made um, basically a book. So we came up with a, a theme and the particular theme of this was labor of love. And 
we asked all of the participating artists to tell us how they viewed that concept, what it meant to them. And we really weren't sure what we were going to get out of that. And we ended up finding out of all of the participants, every single one of the pieces has a different story and a different way they're coming at that theme. So we took all of the pieces, um, they're all nine by 12, and we made, uh, we had one of our other members who does book binding, she made um, like a clamshell. And we, um, like I did the co cover illustration for it, I put together um, like all of the pages that uh, that we made to actually make it like a book format. And we had it all laid out and we put it into a gallery show, like its first gallery show at the beginning of the year. The way we chose to present it in the gallery show was as a sculpture. So rather than having all of the pages just laid out, we uh, like one of the other members on uh, the exhibitions team, she created like, a sculpture that represented her version of labor of love. So that was her contribution to it. So the sculpture had all of our pieces like around it telling a story. And she ended up, uh, cause she's a performative artist. She performed the, her tale of the labor of love. So the intention for the conference was for Anna Sue to uh, go and actually perform this in person so that you guys could uh, see her, her take on that performance. Next month, we have to do it a little bit differently because of how things have changed. So what we're in the process of putting together, we, we filmed the performance. We're gonna show clips of the performance and we're going to do like a little bit like we did here where you know we had um, kind of like a question and answer about like our artwork, except this time I'm going to film it. I'm going to get various artists who, uh, who put their work into the, the folio. I'm going to interview them and ask them to describe what their labor of love is. So we're going to have um, specific interviews in a film that's all going to go together so that you guys can see part of the performance and these interviews and see all of the different takes on it. So that's what we'll be presenting on uh, May 14th. Very exciting. Can't wait to see it. Yeah, I hope it's going to come out good. We're in the process of uh, like getting the rest of that together and finishing it up now for that date. Great. Nothing like a deadline, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's exciting. Thank you for describing that. And um, does anyone have any any final questions before we we uh, log off? No. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. I'm sorry, Nancy. Did you have something? No. Okay. I, I didn't know if you raised your hand. Just a thank you. That's all. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone. Round of applause. It was wonderful to see the artwork and to hear about your projects and, and how you're working. Um, thank you for participating in Second Saturday. And this will be up um, probably later next week on our website for anyone to come and um, see. So do spread the word. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.